and we are live. Welcome in non-violet communication live stream. And uh, my guest today is Nerdalen Plebs. And later on, uh, we will be joined by Nehama from previous streams. So while I'm setting up the meeting here, mm, uh, let's go over the chapter. And so, okay, so it's chapter five and there. Chapter mm, five, edit meeting. So, Nadalian, how was your week? My week was good. Thank you for asking. Uh, what else? No, it was fairly uneventful. Hmm. Yes, the, the end of last week had a bit of drama in it. This week was a little, maybe a bit of fallout hmm. from the drama, but nothing too bad. Okay. So the interesting thing is, uh, apparently I cannot edit <laughs> the live stream yet for some reason. And create, go live. Um, what is your overall impression from the chapter five before we start just a small talk? Overall in impression? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like the, the message of encouraging people to think about the needs, wants and desires behind their feelings. And I like the the probably true statement that in the context of um, say conflicts, it so Rosenberg makes this quite strong statement. I don't know how true it is, but it seems plausible that we're more likely to get compassionate responses from people if we uh, communicate our needs in a vulnerable way rather than sort of taking an accusatory uh, tone with people. Although, I often find myself taking accusatory tones with people. And so I, I think it's maybe a bit more complicated. There is like just a, a very general thing that runs through the whole chapter that I don't think is true is Rosenberg makes a very strong claim that it's impossible for us to cause each other to feel anything. I think if that's true, hmm. then any kind of emotional manipulation is impossible. Any kind of emotional abuse is impossible. And so like, if we can't cause each other to feel anything, then all emotional abuse is self-abuse because we are always the only causes of our feelings. So I, that's, that doesn't seem- I was going to say, do you, do you mind if I jump in here? Because what that immediately implies to me is I, I hear the Bishop Berkeley response is, well, if I can't cause you to feel any pain, you know, I can me stomping on your foot doesn't cause you to feel any pain then either, does it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So, yes, yeah, so I, I think maybe that was just a bit of hyperbole on the author's part um, yeah. to, to get, to get people to realize it, it's true that I think oftentimes we, blame people for things when that's inappropriate, just out of habit of sort of playing the blaming game. So if you're exactly. in the habit of playing the, the blaming game, there can be more um, healthy ways of communicating and like other moves to make rather than just blame the people around you. But I do think we can cause each other to feel things. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, I'll go, go ahead, Kara. <laughs> No, I just wanted to introduce. Uh, so you guys don't see it in the room is also Grandpa from last week. Um, welcome. Yeah, thank you for inviting me back, Kara. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah, no, it's very interesting reading the book for me to compare that to how I process the world, where I have blame and shame on separate levels and cause and effect. And I process those differently. And it's like somebody can be the cause of something, but they don't deserve any shame for it because it was like an accident or, you know, that, that sort of thing. It helps it easier for me to parse out, parse things out. 
Yeah, that makes a bit of sense to me. And one of the other things I noticed is Rosenberg doesn't distinguish a lot of difference between needs and wants and likes. And, you know, yeah. it's, you know, people can want a lot of stuff that they don't need and you can like stuff you don't even want. And some of that, and he also doesn't have a lot of connection as to how realistic those needs or wants or feelings might be. And I always try to use, you know, realism, you know, the real world as a touchstone. It's like, well, I wanted this to happen. How realistic was it for me to want that? Yeah, very, very related to that. He also doesn't bring up rights and uh, duties. That was one of the things I wondered is, is I'm kind of older and I was educated, you know, again, back in the, 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 I was one of the original Sesame Street generation. And did they still teach about how rights and responsibilities are linked, that every right carries a concomitant responsibility of the rest of the society to respect that right? Yeah, I was, I was taught that in school, not okay. too long ago, maybe 20 years ago. <laughs> I interact with people who are thinks it's like I just have that right and you know they don't have to respect other people having the same right. Yeah. I actually popped uh, in uh, for for a short time yesterday to your stream with Ariel and I like Oh, I, I, I'm so, I'm sorry for how that ended. Man, that was awful. I I left. I left. I didn't want to um kind of I, I need to go back and see how I got pillaged afterwards, you know, because I want to see exactly what the complaints was, because I don't understand how to fit in and how to express myself like that. Yeah. I, I feel uncomfortable when it's happening because I feel out of context. I don't know what's going on. And uh, it, uh, it was an interesting thing to observe. Uh, I don't know if Ariel will join. It be, would be cool as well. So maybe we can non-violently talk about it after the presentation. So guys, no, no, that, that would actually be really good for it. Because <laughs> like, that's uh, one of the things I actually talked about that with my counselor yesterday morning. Mm -hmm. And some of that is how do you express no in a non-violent, non-negative way? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, how do you say an unpleasant fact without being accused of being negative oh um how do unpleasant fact without uh, my hint would be sincerity sincerity it's like um wanting the communication to improve it's like what 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 are you aiming at actually what are you trying to do do you, do you try to make conversation better to reach a common ground or do do people just want to dominate and uh, so well again it, you, it all depends on where you're going into who you're interacting with but some of it comes mm -hmm. down to a matter of sort of like you keep you know leaving the uh cap off the toothpaste sort of thing you know, and it's somebody that's, that's like their pet peeve. It just bugs them to no end. And it's like one of those, you could put it on, but you just don't adjust enough kind of thing. And how do you express to them that this is really a problem for you without accusing them? Well, they are causing you a problem because you're being hurt by them not being, being inconsiderate like that. Mm. So you are kind of accusing them but you kind of have to accuse them in order to have your situation improve because otherwise you're just going to keep doing it. I mean, it's just like, if, if you're aiming to improve the situation, it's not an accusation rather than an observation uh, to make people aware uh, of, of their action. Uh, but some of that like depends, evoking, I think. Evoking that response in you, basically. I agree 100%. Some of that, I think, depends on the uh, receiver. Because a lot mm -hmm. of the time, the receiver, you know, that's one of the things I've recognized is somebody can be offended over something that's not offensive. And they can just be so 
hypersensitive, you know, hyper, you know, kind of searching to find outrage in something where there isn't any. And mm -hmm. some of those people, there's almost nothing you can do. Looking for outrage is an interest is an interesting topic. Of course, it seems well, like uh, sometimes people like to look for a battle, and uh, so they just go. Well, outrage is uh, it's social capital these days. <laughs> it's okay. Easy way to get attention, and attention gets monetized. And virtue signaling, and yeah. Oh. So, uh, no, guys, it's I... like. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I just I, I prepared a short uh summary of the book a lecture um, it will be uh it will not be screen shared i will have it right here and so i will just change the slides uh, and uh, we all can still be on a screen and uh, chapter five opens up uh, with uh, negative options uh, here in a negative message, we have four options. How do we take it? So we can blame ourselves. We can blame others. Um, we can um, sense our own feelings and need and kind of internalize as well. Uh, but like not in a blaming way, but a kind of observation of what's going on. And we can do the same for others feelings and needs so uh, any thoughts on blaming ourselves how does it go when somebody says something uh, negative to us and you know, what sample you can think about nerdalian uh, sample i can think about but blaming myself mm -hmm. so i've recently been told that I'm excessively honest when I sort of ran into the same problem as Graham about saying unpleasant things that I feel need to be said because there are some, I guess, conflicts that exist that have to be uh, navigated somehow. And some of the people I interact with prefer to avoid addressing the conflict directly. And so when I bring the, the conflicting points up directly, I get uh, criticized for, I was in, indirectly criticized for being toxically honest. Um, so I, I might have, oh, I, I definitely did consider whether the way I approach things would um, be poisonous for any individual's health, like cause undue problems, or uh, maybe be poisonous for the relationship. Uh, the relationship did did seem to to end as a result of some of the things I openly expressed. Um, yeah, so I, I might have said, "All right, yeah, I'm I'm at fault here. I screwed up a relationship. It's over because I was too honest." So that's how that might look in that example. If I were to blame myself, that's interesting. Toxic honesty. Yeah. <laughs> I want to remember that. <laughs> that that's like a new term for me. That's a new term for me. I hadn't heard that one before. I definitely I qualify I, for it, though. Yeah, I, th I think the person who brought it up invented it just to indirectly tell me how angry they are. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I notice is terms like that, it says a lot about the person who says it more than it does about you because that says that they find to something toxic about honesty, something toxic about the truth. And again, I I'm at the point where if somebody is afraid of the truth and toxic about the truth to, to that level about important things to me, that's probably not a relationship I need to put a lot of stock in and should probably, you know, just keep them more on the fringe for me. Mm. That's interesting. So, uh, Graham, do you uh, remember any story of blaming yourself and hearing an opinion? Negative. Opinion. Um, oh, yeah. No, no. Lots, lots of people give, give negative opinions on me. One of the things that, again, I think is with my autism is I sort that blaming and shaming and cause and effect. 
and it's like because people can just blame you for stuff that you had nothing to do with and you know that that happened with uh you know that happened with my daughter and it wasn't really a blaming but uh you know she she happened to be in the kitchen and i didn't realize that it was her i just heard somebody in the kitchen and it was she poured a bowl of cereal and the cereal poured out of the bowl and onto the floor and that's something i've heard my son do dozens of times because of just just the way he does things so i sat there and said aj did you do that again and it's like no 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 that was my daughter and and i explained to her how i had every reason to think that it was my son instead and you know she, she totally agreed with me that if she was on the outside she would have thought it was it was him not her and that's where the difference between cause and effect and blame and shame comes in is as you know as a child i got my brother was a real whippersnacker and we get into trouble and have me blamed for it so i learned pretty much really early on that i needed to in order to not feel unreasonably blamed check to see if i was actually the cause of the problem and if i wasn't the cause basically just ignore it because they don't know what they're talking about they're lying you know whatever just it's not actually the truth so that's where the touching reality and separating blame and shame from cause and effect kind of save me from a lot of blaming myself which i overly do because i tend to blame myself first before i blame others i'll mm -hmm. tag out that's that's interesting i I kind of blame myself if I agree with it. <laughs> so if somebody points out something, even if it's an opinion, even if it's uh, said in a very negative way, I actually do check with myself if they're correct. And I, I do not take it at face value, though. It's like I actually do check if, if there is a legit um, com complaint in there. Um, then... Uh, I think it also has something to do when people go immediately blaming themselves and finding fault with themselves, with the self-esteem. Like another person is, uh, it's usually a teacher, a parent, somebody of authority. So that person is held in high regard. And we're like, what, what do we know compared to that person? And sometimes we just uh, do not question, not we, but uh, people who tend to blame themselves at face value. Like. Uh, then another point, blaming others. It's this typical reaction with anger. Like you just don't want to hear. Uh, it's like, it's their wrong. I know who I am. I know that they're wrong and they're projecting. It's probably them who have this problem. So this typical response, uh, I also would like to hear. <laughs> it's like, I, I don't ask to confess, but like maybe any examples that you can uh, just even think of about other people. Well, I could just stick, stick to the same example. Um, in that case, um, so, so me raising the, the criticisms um, made people feel uncomfortable. And then it's instead of thinking about the criticism in terms of my needs or their needs or um, agreements that may have sort of implied responsibility to each other, um, they would blame me for being toxically honest or like saying things, in, insensitive things like you should, like shouldn't criticize that way or I shouldn't criticize at all um, trying trying to remember of an example where I would blame someone when they were criticizing me oh yeah in that same example I was I think criticized of I yeah I was criticized so, so this is how fights go right so this this back and forth so I was also criticized for not responding a particular way to how that person responded to my criticism. And my response was to blame that person for expecting me to 
um, respond in a way that I felt would have required me to violate my self-respect. So, yeah, they, they wanted me to, uh, I, I think I can say this word, but to, to briefly describe, to pamper them and to disregard sort of my own boundaries in a way that I, I blame them for criticizing me for not simping for them, more or less. So I, 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 I think I do all four of those options in, in most cases sort of thing uh, how am i to, how am i to blame how's the other person to blame what are my needs what are the other person's needs you can do all of them mm. and you graham now interesting on uh on nodalian if i mispronounced that my apology it's, it's a made-up um. name <laughs> oh okay okay then i don't feel as bad please. mispronouncing it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't feel as bad then <laughs> Oh, I mangle so many words. It's it's horrible. It's um, no. The thoughts that I had there is um, Kara had the has the same mechanism that I do on both sides, which is sort of a truth check, where does it match the objective facts? And if it doesn't, then you need to basically short circuit the the emotional aspect of it. At least that that's my take on it. And um, and I can think of several of them. One of the ones that I can remember is is a situation where I, I call it a fact-free emotional meltdown. And what happened was there was a Halloween party. And my wife and I were going to go walking around a lake afterwards. And I thought it went reasonably well. And... It's about a maybe a 10 minute drive to the lake and we couldn't even get there because before we got there, she had worked herself into, I was at fault and to blame because she didn't enjoy the party as much as she thought she should have enjoyed the party. And my first way of unpacking is, well, how much should somebody expect to enjoy the party? And she just went off the deep end and a total meltdown at that point to screaming at me. And, you know, again, turned around, went back, and there was no walk at that point. <laughs> and that's where I go with a, a you know, with, with a blaming of others sort of thing is you can generate it out of zero facts. Just move what you want and what you need into positions that can't be met in reality. And I'll tag out at this point. Oh, wow. It's, uh, I'm looking for Jeff here. Um, it, it has nothing to do with your situation. I will just speculate. Um, it was never about the party. It was probably about expectations in general. So constant feeling of disappointment with everything, basically. So probably, yeah, I'm, I'm shooting in the dark. I don't know if this situation actually needs any diagnosis. No, you had the same natural take on it that I did, Kara. I wish I could say mm -hmm. that was the case. No, it was a calculated, you know, plot mm. that this was a, a basically a, a narcissistically abusive card that got gets played and it's oh. basically like a, a, a it's like a playbook for like like in football where they they, they map mm. things out and it's all based off of this idea of words and actions not matching and uh i need to get you some of my work on the, on the narcissistic abuse because i've i had to playbook it out just for my own survival here <laughs> But no, no, yeah. it's I want I, yet most normal people that would be what you said mm -hmm. would apply. This is one. It was an intentional, calculated thing where each one of those was a step. It's like I watched it unfold, and it's like I just didn't say anything. She like worked herself in a frenzy, step by step, and it was like it's course of over five minutes until the point where she just worked herself up into screaming, and I just saw how she did it, and it was like man. 
it was an awful thing to see, but you know, yeah. I can figure it out and hopefully diffuse some of it. <laughs> so, oh. g getting back to this one, I think we're just sensing our own feelings and needs. <laughs> <laughs> getting yeah, us back on right. track <laughs> exactly exactly so sensing our own feelings and needs uh, uh, it's like we go in a pattern uh, so Nerdalian do you have here any example I, I know you can bring up the previous example but it's actually a good idea uh, how how um, how you would uh, go through sensing your own feelings and need with regards to the criticism of somebody else Yeah, so I, I, I think depending on how the criticism comes, it can lead to a, a kind of emotional pain to, to hear criticism. Uh, so that, that I would usually sense mostly in my torso, like feel, feel a pain in my torso. I, I sort of have have a thing about not liking to be unfairly blamed. So, yeah, I'll, I'll sense to need to defend myself if I'm being uh, criticized of something that I feel is not true. Should I think of a different example? Um, I actually don't get into that many fights. <laughs> like when I get into fights, they're quite dramatic. But uh, criticized for something. I mean, yeah, it's like when I get criticized for stuff, my own needs aren't usually at the front of my mind. Except if it's like if I get criticized for doing something, I might actually think, well, I did that. Oftentimes, in account of my own needs. Um, I try not to only take my own needs into account. So oftentimes it's also other people's needs that I take into account when I act. Um, so yeah, I may feel into the reasons for my actions if there are good reasons. Um, if there weren't good reasons and I notice that someone else got hurt because of my action, I may go over to self-blame rather than sensing my own needs. So yeah, so I may sense um, not wanting to be criticized or not wanting to wrong people or uh, not feeling good about there being conflict. And I maybe think about the reasons why I have acted in a way that's being criticized or like you guys too, sometimes I get criticized for things I didn't do, just things that aren't true. Then uh, sort of I, I may sense it to a need to, to correct uh, the other person. Don't know what, what else to say about that. That's a difficult mm. question. <laughs> I I don't know. It's it was it seemed uh, like you go into your body sensations, and then also needs what you need is clarity and understanding, basically. So that's that's how I see it. And I usually when I sense. And if a person keeps uh, keeps uh, saying too much criticism and like keeps talking, I, I I go into like I sense being overwhelmed, and I need uh, the criticism to slow down and give me a pause to think about it. If it's an avalanche of criticism, let's say. So how about you, Graham? No, that's an interesting uh, interesting question, especially with the word sensing and and the feelings and needs because I put that in a very much a precognitive state where, you know, the, the senses are, are become feelings and, and it's basically that that's elements of the consciousness. We're not really thinking about it. And for me, that comes into a state of you have, 
you know, my phys- your, your physical needs, your emotional needs, and all of that stuff, and, and those sorts of different needs. And that's where I have like the different feelings will become associated with that, you know, because hunger is definitely going to fit into there. And again, that that loneliness from the lack of love and, and those those various different uh, feelings and needs are where where I'm getting out of that one. And some of them that that's the primary one for me is especially at the moment is, is truth. And that's where for me that I get a uh, almost white light when I have that uh, dissonance between somebody trying to maintain something's true that's false. Like, you know, two plus two equals five. If I think too hard, try too hard on that one, it's very much like a white light in my head pressure, you know, because it's, it's very much a, you know, and, but more of in a group situation that's coming in much more in the, uh, in the gut sort of situation, much lower in the back of the spine, almost PTSD, when it's almost a group pressure from a feeling, from, from a sense. And uh, I think that's all I can add at the moment. I think it's a kind of situational assessment as well, like a sense in own feelings and need, and then combined with the uh, number four, sense in others' feelings and needs. I actually combine those two together usually. So I want to assess the situation as correctly as possible. Uh, it's like, I, it's like the, basically three and four are combined. It's like me and another person in order to reach the best level of communication. Basically, how about you, Nartalia? Yeah, I also try to do that. Um, it goes with the need for clarity and understanding. If someone's criticizing, sort of, oftentimes the criticism isn't very clear about what exactly they're getting at, what exactly they're unhappy about, or pointing out should have been better. So, to I say, oftentimes it is personal needs driving those things but it, it's not always i do, do think sometimes um people can speak on behalf of others so um, yeah. it's sort of i've been criticized by third parties for mistreating uh, a different third party and yeah i, I guess they have a, a need for me to be a better person or whatever but that seems like an awkward way to go about it actually i think responsibilities and duties and, and rights um, roles and that kind of stuff is sometimes a useful way to communicate about um, managing expectations and managing cooperation. So I think needs and wants alone only get you so far. Um, but yeah, it, it helps to think of, of needs, both myself and the person giving the criticism and potentially relevant third party stakeholders. It's some, oftentimes uh, conflicts are multilateral rather than just two people having a nonviolent communication thing. And yeah, like I said, I combine the blame if there are uh, agreed upon um, duties or responsibilities that were violated. I do think people can be to blame for violating uh, laws or people's constitutional rights. So, uh, I think the blame might be appropriate. And I sometimes think that feeling ashamed of myself for not living up to um, my own standards for for what a good person is is appropriate. I mean, I think that pain is a motivating force for becoming a better person. I think rather than running away from the pains to allow it to to drive me to, uh, to try to do better next time and not I try not to blame people who criticize me when it's appropriate um, for causing me the pain of shame. Uh, rather, I, I try to be grateful for helping me grow as a person. That's way easier to say than to do, though. Uh, and sometimes I only feel grateful a bit after, so, so when some time has passed, and upon reflection, in the moment, I may become quite angry. Uh, yeah. And you, Graham, how do you understand gonna... feelings of others? Yeah. 
No, I was going to say I was fascinated by what uh, Nerdalian was saying. Now, for me, sens sensing the feelings of others is I question a lot of times if there are a lot of people out there who are unable to do it because it's like they don't see others as another human being with feelings and needs. They see him as like a resource, like their phone to be exploited and disposed of once the convenient exploitation is done. And that becomes, you know, the way I sense the needs of others is I'm very conscious of targeting we versus me and the difference between the two. And I always try for a collaborative target where both me and the other person are benefiting. And I, it's a lot of people and, and, you know, it's, it's one of those where in most, like, again, in the, I hate negotiating and bar you know, and that, that haggling. It's like, I would much rather go, let's go 60, 40, you get the 60 and let's just dispense with all that haggling. And unfortunately with too many people, it's like the, Oh, you'll take 40. Well, you take 35. And at that point I just walk away. Cause you didn't get the point. There was going to be no haggling. <laughs> you just broke the deal. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And that's, uh, yeah, no, that, 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 that's where I'm at with, you know, it's, you need to have the other person also sensing your needs. It needs to be a, uh, mutual egalitarian two-way kind of thing otherwise if you're doing it and they're not you're just going to get preyed upon mm -hmm. as i can vouch for i'm going to uh, tag out right now i i think about that idea about sensing others feelings and needs i can't do that i need to ask questions so i'll be like okay let's Let's assess the way you feel now. And they would go like, no, 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 no. Like, let's not do that. It's like, okay, maybe um, what was the, the, the thing you would like me to, to do in response to your criticism? Uh, like, and they were like, I would like you to feel guilty. And then, then I would sense what they need from me. And I usually would ask, why? <laughs> Like, why do you want me to feel guilty? Is it really about that thing or about something else? And then we would get into conversation. Um, that's ideally what would happen if I would never have emotional reactions with door slamming. So, again, like I, I always like after slamming the door, I was like, that was appropriate. And then I would talk myself into it, which is not correct according to Marshall Heroes and work. But for that case, I agree with Nerdalian. Every situation needs their own reaction. It's like we we the ones deciding about that. Uh, so and yeah. Next slide. Um, here is an example of two people reacting, uh, uh, to, uh, like saying uh, criticism in two different ways. Person A, you disappointed me by not coming over last evening. Nardalian, what do you read the person B? <laughs> Yeah, I'll read person B. I was disappointed when you didn't come over because I wanted to talk over some things that were bothering me. Okay, so it's like semi-same criticism uh, uh, verbalized differently. So, Graham, which one you like more, person A or person B? Myself? Yeah. Like... <sighs> I'm indifferent between the two. Oh. It's a matter of the first <laughs> one. Well, the first one is like, yeah, you're disappointed that it didn't happen. That's totally understandable. Mm -hmm. The second one just takes that and fills in the, the blank of why you are disappointed. And, you know, it's kind of nice to know that you had some things, you know, that you wanted to talk about that were bothering you, you know. Mm -hmm. 
one of the things that I wonder is that might have been something that I understood, be, be, you know, if I didn't know that before I came over again, it's a now we're hitting one of those points where why am I hearing it after it won and say I had a flat tire and I was tired at flat tire on the way home from work, just didn't feel like heading over. But I didn't know that there was a problem. We were planning our t typical, you know, Thursday night get together. It's just I wasn't up to it because I had a bad day. And but if you if the person had said that stuff was bothering me and it was that important to him, I would have made that extra effort. And that's where you get into this touchy zone with the second one, where the first one is is a very okay. very causes that the that I didn't show up, and I'm not bothered by that from a call. I, see where the, it almost feels more blamey in a sense mm -hmm. do you guys get any of that sense i am i mean when i hear it uh, i would like oh to both of those because what i hear while reading is oh my god you were waiting for me i'm so sorry i disappointed you <laughs> like that would be my reaction to either of those so i i don't know like there is like apparently according to marshall b rosenborg one of them implies guilt and in the other one it was owning up to it but i i read both of those messages kind of the same the person really wanted to see me and they got disappointed and i was like oh my god that feels so good <laughs> <laughs> so like i would take both of it as a compliment so that's that's just me how about you Nerdalia? yeah i have a bit of that too um yeah so like what rosenberg says he doesn't like about that is the sorry guy i think you made a similar point but you were breaking up a little bit um that in a there's the use of by so you disappointed me by and Rosenberg says, no, you can't cause someone disappointment by doing anything. Like if anyone's disappointed, it's their own doing always, which doesn't seem right to me. So I'm, um, yeah, like the, the fact that A is, has a causal element to me isn't bothersome. Um, and then, yeah, so in, in B, there's extra information, as Graham said, that's, that's nice to have. Um, sometimes actually version C that I might do is I might skip the you disappointed me or the I was disappointed entirely and just let them know there was something bothering me that I wanted to talk about because uh, that seems like the most relevant like there may be there's still something bothering me that I want to talk about so can we please talk about the thing that's bothering me regardless of whether I was disappointed or not yeah but, even regardless of phrasing it <laughs> But it, like, it, it, there is something like intimate by um, admitting to someone that you had feelings because of their behavior. Because yeah. like in most in, in most relationships, if people behave like people, are just, I just feel indifferent. Like most people do things, and I don't feel any feelings. Don't feel disappointed. I don't feel happy. I, I just feel nothing for most people. So and, and yeah, there's a bit of a risk in looking like a fool when you say like, oh, I. You did something and I had feelings about it. Um, could be good. <laughs> get you in trouble. <laughs> so it's obviously always the uh, what is in between the lines? What does the person actually mean by saying that? Like, uh, and then both of those, I, I just like read that wonderful vulnerability and, and stuff. Yeah. What do you think about that, Graham? No, no, I was going to say N Nadalian was making a lot of good points there. It was I no, mean, causing it... me to feel a little uncomfortable with all the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're genuine. Trust me, if I thought you were wrong, I'd tell you. <laughs> I, I no. trust you. I'm just, I'm just playing. I no, really it... love criticizing the book, though. <laughs> well, it's it, I'm glad Rosenberg puts it out there and gives a structure that you can criticize. You know, that's, you know, that's how you make progress in this stuff. You, you put out what you think and others build off of it and find out where you got, what you got right, what you, what you didn't. And he's very helpful. And, you know, going through there, I saw he's very helpful, but it's within a narrow range of situations. 
you can't be in any sort of abusive situation and have nonviolent communication, have a hope of improving the situation. You know, extreme poverty. You're just, you know, that th th your basic needs of life need to be met before you can really start worrying too much about whether your communication is violent or not. It, it's it's a higher level uh, Maslow need on the hierarchy. Yeah. You know, I you know, agree. but uh, but I was gonna say, you know, it's it's the two of them back to back. Yeah, okay, we can go on, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, Graham, finish your point. I can go back to the other one. What did you say? No, no, I didn't. I, I, I didn't have it. I didn't have anything of really uh, significance that I can't add going forward. <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Graham, would you mind uh, reading for person A? Sure. Example two. A, they're canceling the contract really irritated me. B. When they canceled the contract, I felt really irritated because I was thinking to myself that it was an awfully irresponsible thing to do. I, I kind of clearly like person B here because like that, that that's mm, just because of the effort put into wording and explaining it to other implies like they, they, they really need people to understand and I relate to that. So how about you, Nardari? Yeah, I, I think it depends on who the audience is. Like, is, mm. the, is your reason for getting irritated is that practically important? Or is, is it an intimate relationship where, like, you're confiding details in each other? Or is it enough to just, I'm irritated right now. Oh, did I do something? No, they're canceling the contract irritated. All right, so nothing to do with us. Yes, just please be patient with me while we talk. I, I would like a... Um, but yeah, B has, has more information. So sometimes that may be helpful. Hey, Jill. Yeah. Welcome, Jillette. We just started. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> no. We I'm went through, just... <laughs> uh, through just uh, two slides, basically. So this okay. is a third slide to put into context. Uh, we are discussing the difference between communicating, canceling a contract. And... Um, it's person A and person B, one gave more explanation. So if you want to relate or would you like to see that one and wait till the next slide? I'll wait till the next gonna, slide. Yeah. I was gonna say, I got something to say on that one first though. So he, I, he, I, he can certainly, uh, could you pop yourself back up there, Kara, so I can read it? Uh, you don't see me? Yeah, no, no, I couldn't read it off your small screen. No, it's like on this on on B, I actually find A much better because B, I see the last part as projecting onto the person irresponsibility. Because they unless they know why the contract was canceled, they're they don't know that that was an irresponsible thing to do for that business. It might have been that they hated canceling the contract, but they had to because their business situation required that being the sensible business move. And from that sense, that person was not irresponsible. They did the responsible thing. It's just the responsible thing for their business hurt you. And to me, that's a real flaw in, in the B response. And however, that's encapsulated within saying that person was thinking that to themselves. So now they may not, they're, they're projecting that within their own mind, but they're also doing a self, maybe doing a self blaming because they're, they're sitting there and blaming themselves for the projecting. And are they irritated themselves because they were projecting there about it? In which case now it really doesn't have anything to do so much with the canceling the contract. It's because they were projecting something that they shouldn't have been. And now they're only irritated at their own response as opposed to the contract themselves. And the first one's very clear cut. Contract got canceled. They're irritated. And they don't really care why the contract was canceled. They're going to be irritated regardless. And that's just a much more true, clear one. The other one, like I said, I'm not even sure what level of unpacking 
actually fits what the person's situation, the truth of the person's situation, because they could have phrased it poorly too. And it's just, it's a little too muddled for my take. I'm going to tag out now. No, Graham, you're uh, actually correct uh, because the true reason for irritation was not really given. It's irresponsible thing to do is not actually a reason. Uh, the reason of irritation would be like the answer C and uh, saying, which is not here, but I like would be saying, um, I was hoping to hire people uh, from the last contract. So when they canceled, actually those people don't get a job and that irritates me. So that would be the answer C, would, which would be ideally defining the reality of the situation rather than just uh, in both cases, uh, expressing feelings. Um, I think I disagree mm -hmm. in this case. Mm -hmm. But I'm coming. I'm maybe, no, 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 no. I'm no. maybe just contrarian for no reason. Uh, but I think I, I. So the value I see in answer B compared to answer A, uh, and I wonder what you would think about it, um, Ram. Is <clears throat> if you gave answer A, and then you're saying that really irritated me, or you're describing what you feel, and I think at, at that point, if I'm communicating with you saying that, I'm like, well. Okay, you were irritated. Now, what to do about that? When you say something, you know, when you say something like, I thought I felt myself that, that was an irresponsible thing to do. Well, now I understand a bit more where you're coming from. And there might be uh, a way to bridge that. Like, if I can tell you, look, I get that. I get why you would think that it was an irresponsible thing to do. And maybe I could say, you know what? You're right. It was an irresponsible thing to do. You were right to be irritated. Or I could say, no, no, look, the bigger picture is this and it wasn't irresponsible. There's something about it that kind of lends room to something other than whether you were right to be irritated or wrong to be irritated. Like there's something that that manages to open a kind of bridge to like, where did you come at this from? And I think answer C would be like similar what what you did, what you offered. Like it's another way of why you thought it would be if that the situation was different. Like some practical reason. No, I want to sit there and say I hundred percent agree with you, Galad. There's a lot more um, hooks for further exploration and further conversation and communication in Part B. I was looking at it from a clarity standpoint and from more of a nonviolent standpoint, where the first one, it doesn't really carry a lot of blaminess as, you know, for me, as much as the second one, I don't have to try to figure out exactly what the person is trying to say as much. But I 100% agree with you that those additional hooks, especially in somebody that you're trying to um, help diffuse why they're upset help them with, you know, figure out, you know, help them feel better about the situation. B is definitely better in that sort of situation. Hmm. So excellent points. Thank you. Um, just before we go to the next slide, I wanted to read the comment um, from the live chat. This chapter discusses the most important issue that most people do wrong or do not understand at all. It is hard for everyone to search um, codes inside yourself and find it. It's from Irina. Even if people blade themselves, it is usually the result of a depression and as a result, they cannot understand reasons and solve it. So they just go into blaming themselves. Yeah, excellent points. Thank you, Irina. And let's upload the next slide. Okay. There. So, uh, well, that's a little bit tiny, tiny printed. I hope you guys can read. I like if Graham, are you using the mobile device? So it was the tiny screen. No, I'm using my laptop. 
Okay, so is it possibly to read for you, or should I? Kind of no, no, I, I can read that as long as I, I can read that as long as you're on the big screen. Uh, okay. Okay. Mm. So here, are, here are the speech patterns that mask accountability for our own feelings, and I like. If you don't mind, guys, I would like you to take turns uh, one, two, and three uh, accordingly, Nardalian, Gilad, and Graham. Sure, no problem. Uh, pattern number one, use of impersonal pronouns such as it and that. For example, it really irritates me when spelling mistakes appear in our public brochures. Number two is statements that mention only the actions of others mommy is disappointed when you don't finish your food Graham? uh can you put yourself on full screen cara uh, so i can read it I, I can't get that big enough on okay when I zoom. um there How about that? The, that, that oh. that's good i'll figure out try to figure out what the i don't know if i can see the last lines oh okay don't worry uh, i will um i will read it the use of the expression i feel uh, and any emotion because and followed by the person you and any other pronoun of the person the example I feel hurt because you said you don't love me. Okay, so um, I just just uh, as an exercise, how would you uh, guys fix those expressions in a non-violent way? Fix the expressions. Yeah. Number one. I kind of remember the, the example a little bit, though. Um, I think the, the key thing Rosenberg wants is to for people to add um, the needs that are driving their feelings. Um, like as Irina said, assuming they, they know the true causal needs behind their feelings, um, which is often very difficult to do. So people can be mistaken about that. It takes a lot of self-insight to, to know what that is. And... Um, Not so sure exactly um, what what's bad about impersonal pronouns. Um, so, like for for example, saying when there are mistakes in public brochures takes out the impersonal pronoun it, but I'm not sure exactly. I think what that fixes. I think what they mean, if I'm, I'm not sure if I like it, but I think what, the, what the book means sh should be done to be fixed is when you say, I get really infuriated because that's a personal pronoun, which I find to be, in my experience, the exact same emotional context of the, of the sentence, but I might be misreading the whole thing. Um, no, that's that's I think how he meant it. it. It's weird because, like, why are the pronouns more important than the other parts? I mean, he said it says it's it really infuriates me. So it's not like you were saying like if if oh. the sentence was, it is really infuriating when that happens, then I would kind of be on board, but it seems to oh. me like. I, I think that the confusion for me is because I disagree with him that things can cause us to feel things like things outside of ourselves can have causal impact on how, how we're feeling. He says others can never cause us to feel things. They can be stimulus that we decide ourselves to respond to with feelings. I don't think that's quite how feelings work. Um, there's some control we have, but I, I think things can influence our feelings. So the difference between what I think he's pointing out with the impersonal product, it really infuriates me, puts a, like a abstract it as causing my feelings. Whereas when I say I feel infuriated, like I am the source of the infuriated feeling 
and he thinks we are always the source of our own feelings and no it or them or they or stuff ever infuriates us we always in infuriate as an action um, mm. so that's what I, yeah thanks for listening to you make me think of that difference yeah i'm not 100 percent on, on board with that but uh Interesting. Here's, I was going to say, let, let me tag in here. One of the places where I find those pronouns so problematic is they basically become containers that you don't have to unpack. It becomes an it that it be, could be a person. It, it, it basically becomes an undefined object at that point where you don't know at that point what the exact cause of the generating problem is. And in order to get to that point, you need to unpack exactly what that it or that might be. That's where I, I mean, see it as being yeah. really problematic. So, so Go ahead. In, in that in that example, it's pretty clear. It's like when there are spelling mistakes in the public brochures. So I, I yeah, I, I can also think of examples where people use such obscure pronouns to make things unclear. But in that specific example, I think it's it's not obs obscuring much of anything. It's just phrasing something in a way implying that something outside is causing internal feelings which Rosenberg thinks actually states explicitly is impossible i think uh, listening to the two of you speak i i also think i kind of understand where in what kind of uh, situation it might be um, more relevant which is when when this uh it like you were saying, Graham, becomes uh, just a way to kind of unload uh, the whatever responsibility you have for your own feelings to to the world, right? Because that I, I agree with you, um, Francois, that this is uh, this is not everything, right? And and I don't agree with him on that, but I certainly think that there's there's a point where you know you're walking around with your friends. And you see something that you find morally wrong and you say like, ah, it really gets on my nerves when I see that, you know? And, and the point is, right, c comparing that is like, you know, I get really irritated. You know, like that's, that's something that happens to me rather than uh, that's something that uh, I'm simply right in being uh, responsive to. So I don't know if that resonates. It, it does. It sounds like owning your feelings rather than putting it on uh, undefined it. So like uh, putting your own feelings first, basically, uh, somehow. It's not that it is the root, but me. I feel irritated. I am the one. Yeah. Yeah, I think even if it's not the root, you, you can at least, I mean, it's important to take responsibility for whatever part of it is uh, inside you, because it's certainly not purely outside. No, good good points, Galad. It's, it is doing whatever it is doing, and you're having the reaction you're having to whatever it is doing. It's like a two-part process, and you have to own both parts. I think that's where you're getting at. And I 100% agree with that. Mm -hmm. So in the second example, it's, it's kind of feeling of blame a little bit. Uh, it's like, mommy is disappointed when you don't finish your food. It's like, that okay, the mother but, saying it? Because that would make yes. it even more disturbing. Just talking yes. about herself in the third person. Yeah. No, <laughs> yes. No I have a mommy problem. gets disappointed. It's like, how do we fix mommy in that situation? <laughs> I would like Graham to take a shot at it, at fixing that that phrase. Mommy is disappointed. I was going to say my first instinct is you fix that by calling child services, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, Basically, it's a, again, that, that could be so dangerously unhealthy there. 
I'm trying to unpack it both from an emotional and, and a physical health standpoint. And the two, two, two are kind of separate at times because you can unpack it and say, it's like, you know, honey, I worked very hard fixing that food and, you know, this is the amount, and I'm going to assume that they're not, you know, basically going the foie gras route and stuffing their kids. And basically it's like, you need to eat enough calories in order to, you know, to, 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 to play and do all the things you need to do as a kid. So, you know, you need to, this is what you need to do, even if you don't like to do it. And I would take that approach. Tag out. I guess like the, there's a few things. Right? One is, like he says, you don't want to um, offload things onto other people. Like parents do that a lot. You know, wait, wait till dad gets home or something like that you know, or something like um, the, the kind of um, thing where you don't, you, you, you kind of uh, avoid the argument, avoid the discussion about whatever negotiation needs to happen between the parent and the child by saying, no, no, this is non-negotiable because it's the other person, right? So, so you have to eat because otherwise mom would get disappointed and you don't want that, right? Because you love her or something like that, that kind of manipulation uh, about that. And I think it's uh, it's just kind of uh, like too easy and too uh, harmful. Like it's a, it's a path that I, I would agree with him here that a better a better way to phrase that would be something like, you know, man, it's really disappointing for me. No, I wouldn't say it. I'd say I get really disappointed. <laughs> I, I experience deep disappointment every time. No, that's passive aggressive. Uh, <laughs> how can you say that? I don't know. It's it's a bad sentence, I guess. Just no. look, honey, honey, honey. Just finish your food. Come on. Yeah, that that one is yeah. that one is the last one is the bad one. <laughs> but like I, before I give my final verdict as a mommy, I would like to hear their Dalian version. I mean, just one more thing i would just like to say that it it's weird for me this kind of uh owning up to your feelings when you're with kids or in general like when when there's a hierarchy thing right your kids don't need to be informed that all of your emotional and internal processes and saying you know the fact that you're disappointed that they didn't eat is not a burden that your kid needs to actually bear yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that comment's actually very related to the comment I wanted to make. Because the the language, the structure of the phrase, except for the speaking of herself in third person, is almost exactly the same as the statement of disappointment in a previous example, when the person said, uh, you not showing up made me feel disappointed. And the change of context in the one, Cara felt, oh, and in this one, Cara's you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think the context matters a lot and that social hierarchy is, is a thing and the, uh, the maturity and the abilities of the people listening, like the audience matters. And Kara mentioned a little, little bit about the intention behind the communication happens. Uh, it's just a general point, but I've, I've seen people sort of follow the letter of the law of all like the rules of NVC while they're angry at each other and sort of stabbing each other's as much as they can without breaking the rules and just being passive aggressive with each other using NVC language. And that's no, no use either. Um, so yeah, I, I think in, in that case, for, for me personally, it's the, it's the implied manner in which the mother is trying to manipulate the child that's problematic more than the fact that the mother used a sentence in which she only mentioned other people's actions and the structure of the sentence i think is less the defining thing than the actual 
relationship dynamic and the context and the intentions behind that. Uh, that's what I think. I agree on on the actual uh, idea that the sentence itself doesn't uh, show the proper example to state statements that um, mention only the actions of other and blame. So it's just like uh, just because it's a kid and there is hierarchy involved and responsibility and it's not a fair negotiation actually the kid needs to eat and so the conversation would usually go in practice like that um so let's talk in experience here yeah but, but let's try to think of, of, of even like another situation let's say mm -hmm. you know you're with friends and before we move on to another situation i want to hear mommy cora hold on Juliet. i will give you a chance to address it so um that 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 idea that the truth is when the child isn't eating and they do need to eat because you know i say just that why do i need to eat it's like normal food where i would rather eat something else chips sweets and stuff it's like eat normal food because it's healthier and they're like nah i only want something else i like that the child child doesn't get the concept because it's healthier so in order to say what you actually need as a mommy and you need your child to eat and the feeling of disappointment doesn't like why would i feel disappointed with my child I, I would feel just angry <laughs> like i would not disappointed i would even not get there i'd be like dude you have to eat because you have to not because i said so but because it's actually what's needed for your own health and stuff so uh, the way that it would go in reality is uh, eat your food and they're like no it's like well no gaming eat your food and then gaming and then it would go so so the only way is just negotiation and yeah so that's my my kind of point of view on mommy how would i fix that mommy also speaking in a third person never do that with children because they will go to school and speak about themselves in a third person and which would make them socially inadequate, which would absolutely harm your kids. Yeah, speak to your kids as if you want them to speak to other. So, yeah. Here is like a little say, tantrum. Let, <laughs> let me jump in and before we move on on that, how my mother resolved those situations. She had the <laughs> approach of, uh, she had the category of things are, you're going to do it. The question is whether you're going to do it willingly or unwillingly. <laughs> Tagging out. <laughs> yeah, Irish mothers. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's the point where it would be disingenuous to call it nonviolent communication, since the violence is within the the statement itself. It's like you know, you're going to <laughs> apply, you know, conditioning what you can or cannot do. We will limit your freedom. <laughs> so, um, or else, or maybe, or maybe it's nonviolent communication. Maybe as long as you're upfront about it, then the violent part is not the communication, right? You, you were doing the violence outside of the communication. No, I, I honestly, think I, yeah. I think you're right. It is violent, but I think sometimes violence is appropriate. Yeah, so there's like this whole book. There's an assumption that nonviolence <laughs> is always better than violence. As sometimes not. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I, I just uh, want to like, say about the other situation yeah. that that was bugging me because I, I really I'm struggling with this point. Even if this weren't a hierarchy and it wasn't a kid, let's say you're you're throwing a surprise party to a, a close friend and another friend, you know, is calling in and say, ah, I'm not gonna make it. And you're saying, Well, you know. Friend A, the guy who has a birthday, is going to be really disappointed that you're not going to make it. He really wants you to be there. I don't see how this statement that only mentions others is somehow manipulative or violent. He really is going to be disappointed, right? This, I'm not 
manipulating you. I'm just like, man, that's the situation. Statement of truth. I think it's a question of whether the person feels compelled to attend because you've pointed out that truth to them. In that case, they can feel manipulated into it, but that's entirely from their response to your truthful statement. That's within them, not you manipulating them. They feel compelled, but they haven't been manipulated. And they may even feel manipulated, even though they weren't. Yeah, uh, what, I, what I'm asking or trying to point out is I don't understand how the mentioning of other people is in itself an issue. Right. If if it's relevant, then it is, and if it's not, then it's weird. I think that's going back. To, I was going to say I think that goes back to Rosenberg's principle of nothing from outside can affect you. So therefore, if you're attributing something outside, you're thereby misstepping. And I think that's a fact facet of Rosenberg, as opposed to us trying to speak talk more about how that would apply to the real world. Sorry to step on you, Nadalian. What, what do you have to say? Yeah, so that, I agree with that. And just to add to that, he really wants people to add the underlying needs behind the feelings. So when you just say, mention the feeling and then mention someone else's action, you're leaving out the part of what your needs are. And I think that's his, he wants us to add in um, our needs and our desires. So yeah, I, th I think Irina did, did a correction of that very close to what uh, Rosenberg wants in the comments. Um, I don't know, shall I go ahead and, and read it? Yeah, I read Irina's said, comments. As she said, I feel disappointed when you do not finish your food because I am afraid that you may get ill and I worry about you. Something like that. Um, yeah, so sort of giving, I think Irina sort of backed up the, the feeling with more feelings um, rather than a, a want to desire. I think Rosenberg's um, example would be to say, because I want you to grow up strong and healthy, something like that. Um, so yeah, he's providing a structure. And I think for a lot of people that would be better than just shooting from the hip as they have been habitually. Um, but it's, yeah, the, the structure seems to have some, some gaps and some flaws. Well, it is a good thing to, ta to teach your kids to take into consideration the feelings of others uh, like to be mindful of those it, it is a good point so uh, so what what Irina's comment kind of enriches the knowledge of a child on all the palette of feelings that he's not eating food may may evoke and and then the child can make a uh, like as inner self motivation to eat because those feelings exist and maybe get in touch with the feelings. So I, I, I want to. I don't know if if I'm just kind of hijacking that, but I think it's I think it's interesting to kind of uh, consider uh, what Irina was saying. Um, I'm I'm genuinely you know not sure which which approach would be better. Like Irina also said, it has a cost. I don't know. For me, it feels like. Uh, like um, uh, Nerdalian was saying, sometimes violence is is better. And I think uh, for kids, at least, you know, for me as a kid, it, it was nice when my parents sometimes said, like, just do this. Like, like Graham was saying, either you do it willingly or unwillingly. Right? That's the sort of um, boundary that you say, okay, you know, well, if my parents have that kind of uh, uh, veto right about me, then, then that's okay. I don't have to worry about everything because I just need to do those, those few things. Whereas, you know, if everything is kind of out in the open and they're uh, you know, sharing about uh, exactly why they think I should eat and now I need to kind of, I don't know, either either understand that or more likely kind of internalize the the underlying emotional dynamics that this creates. I think, I don't know, my impression is that it makes 
it makes that situation more complicated. And, and in that sense, I think it might be interesting. I'll, I'll end there. So Irina continues, I, I find it actually feasible to get the, an understanding from uh, the kid on such things. Uh, it was possible for me, it, it has its cost. Uh, you have to explain everything you do all your life, no obedience by default ever. So, so it's, it's never because I said so, but it's an explanation to make a child like emotionally aware. Yeah, so critical uh, kid gets critical thinking, but I also think uh, that type of behavior will raise emotional intelligence, actually, by far. It's like, that's how my mom was, actually. Like, she, she kept explaining to me, like, I, it never was because I said so, but why? And stuff like that. Yeah. So now we touched on parenting. It's excellent. <laughs> So, uh, do you guys feel okay with the with the second example, or should we go to stage three? Uh, the, the the third one. Uh, so, the use of the expression "I feel anger," let's say, because you did something, and. Um, as example, I feel hurt because you said you don't love me. I mean, I don't see anything wrong with that sentence, though. Like, I, it's like, <laughs> it's like, like absolutely honest sentence. Uh, so I, I guess I did not get that part of nonviolent communication. I, I think, uh, like what Rosenberg is trying to say here, he's like, I feel hurt because I want you to love me so much, but you you said you don't but like it's it's just like explaining the same thing like correct me if i'm wrong guys i don't know but i am with you in not knowing i think it's just a another example of that rosenberg doesn't think that because word is ever correct Because uh, you like like Kara, I've I've never felt any anything because you did anything, and Jalad, I've <laughs> never felt anything because you did anything. Everything I, I always feel is one hundred percent my choice, and nobody affects me in any way, whatsoever. I think that's the kind of like gimmick that Rosenberg is working with when he says <laughs> other people can be stimulus, but we always choose how we feel, and he wants us to always be responsible for how we feel. So if someone you love doesn't love you back. It's hundred percent on you for feeling sad about that. <laughs> it's like no, you have to own out, own up to it in your speech. So instead of like using the pronoun uh, you or person's name or any other form, you it has to be followed because I. Not only that, because I feel or I need something. Isn't that really narcissistic? I actually think it's kind of it is. <laughs> So what do you think, Graham? Graham is the biggest uh, specialist on narcissism. I, like, I'm still learning what narcissists are. Yeah, no, that definitely sows the, definitely sows the seeds for narcissism there. That is, um, you know, as I boil it down to, you know, they're talking about emotion there. Talk about sensation. I feel pain because you stepped on my foot. How is that possibly, you know, <laughs> yeah, you're basically trying to say that the sen a person's senses and all of that one is entirely self-contained and separate from reality. And now you're talking that it's like, in a sense, he expects it to be solipsistic, where it's entirely self-contained. And, you know, I do see that as a flaw with what Rosenberg's doing, and I think... And again, I think Rosenberg's creating a structure that it's worth exploring, but I, it does lay the seeds for that narcissism where, as I sit there and I've said the joke a bunch of times is, uh, you know, when I was in my teens, they had the book that was, I'm okay, you're okay. And we slid that from I'm okay, you're okay to I'm perfect, you're a piece of shite. <laughs> Tag out. <laughs> It also like sows the seeds for a very convenient excuse that so that if if I were to take that on board and I wanted to be a complete asshole, 
I could just be the asshole I want. And if anyone has feelings about that, that's their problem. If your feeling is your problem, I'll just flip. I have the right to be the most me that I can be. Like I'm doing me. Like you, your feelings, go meditate, but don't bother me with your feelings. Yeah. I think uh, I think that's really really a sharp a sharp point because this book right if if this were something that uh, were only like in a vacuum let's say you are you're the only person who reads this book and you could never communicate its message then you could talk about like how it how it uh, affects like your life but but most of the time it's like, okay, let's set that so we both follow the rules. And then and then, like you said before, it can be this kind of passive aggressive or or actually accusatory thing. Like, like it's not because I you, I just said I don't love you. You just for some unfathomable reason feel hurt right now, and you're projecting that on me in such a, an unfair manner. Read the book. Yeah, no, for me, what it boils down to is they're basically saying their words don't have meanings, their commitments don't have meanings. You know, oh, that thousand dollars that I borrowed from you last week that I said I was going to pay you today. No, I don't got it. You're upset with me. That's all you. What? I'm just being me. Why? You can't be my friend if you're going to react like this. To, 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 to you just get upset with me over something like something. I'm just, I'm just doing me. I'm just doing me. Do you have more money for me to borrow? Oh, Tag out. Yeah. No, no, but that's that does uh, sound like um, actually people I know. Uh, so absolutely no responsibility whatsoever. And if I ever express any feeling it would be reacted like you acting violently and really aggressively right now and it was like yeah i do have legitimate claim and i own up to it uh, and you actually did do something to cause it and that 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 hurts so what do you guys think next slide oh, i just yeah. had one more thing about yeah. it you can say on the next slide uh, mm -hmm. that it's it's also very consistent with uh, other problems that I've had with uh, with this book and with Marshall uh, Rosenberg mm -hmm. is I think it's the second chapter where he says that words like good and evil are basically ways to prevent us from productive communication and uh, they're put upon by the structures that were beneficial for kings and monarchs or something, some like very, very strong and rather preposterous claim for which he offers zero evidence and is not <laughs> like convergent with anything I've ever heard. And he's like, I'm just going to put that in my book as though that's a thing that's legitimate. And that, that's the sort of thing that really kind of you know ticks me like you don't do that even if you think that like you don't put it in, in the actual book <laughs> well I, I would not throw the baby with the bath water here like it, it does have um, have like if i were to understand where he's coming from um yeah he's trying to give this structure as graham points out but like uh even if he gives the structure that we push against, it still is something to push against. Like even if the sentence uh, we completely disagree with. So yeah, it... I, I I agree. I'm not I'm not saying like we shouldn't agree that, but I'm saying that it's not an isolated thing about like for instance, um, you know that you nothing can affect you. Right, mm -hmm. you control yourself, and like Graham said, like words have actually no meaning, and also, right, even good and evil are not even real concepts. So it's, so it's not. It's important to kind of point out if you want to keep the baby and throw the bathwater, like where the mm -hmm. baby is and where the bathwater. Right. So, so I think that's yeah. that's a lot of bathwater that's that's worth uh, <laughs> chucking out, like 
those those are concepts to to notice. That's very mm -hmm. violent of you to like and why why would you say that? Why wouldn't you say what you actually felt? I'll, I'll say what you actually felt <laughs> when 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 it's uh such when, an impersonal pronoun. I'll, I'll say how I felt. I <laughs> I I felt when Gillard criticized uh, Rosenberg <laughs> for making claims about the concepts of good and evil that uh, Gillard expressed disagreement with um, in a manner that I thought would violate the principles of nonviolent communication. I felt joy because <laughs> <laughs> I have a need. I want to make humorous fun of people saying things that I think is stupid. You see how fun it is to talk this way? It makes conversation <laughs> fluent and everything just it's you know, like quick. No. <laughs> uh, I, I just like have one request for Marshall B. Rosen. Okay? Please don't haunt me. Rest in peace. <laughs> That's it. Oh, okay. So, and like one of the last hard thinking slides and the rest is just fun. The way we relate to others. And I would like Graham read the first one. Graham, do, are you, can you see it on the big screen? Okay, am I going? Yeah, okay. no, you're here, you're here. No, I, was, I had muted myself, my bad. Mm -hmm. The first one is emotional, the way we relate to others, emotional slavery. We see ourselves responsible for others' feelings. Do you want me to unpack it or just? No, um, it's just like uh, those are the stages I, I failed to mention. Those are the stages we go uh, when we receive communication from others. And you just read the first stage. Okay. And uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, you can unpack it, Graham. You're right. Like we, we should discuss it. I'm, I'm still figuring things out, guys. It's like my first, uh, first lead this time. Oh no, I was going to say the the insight I had on that one is you're basically chaining yourself to the feelings of others, and in that is the sense that I'm seeing it as the, as the emotional slavery, where it's basically how others feel will determine what you do and uh, tag the two i would i would add like i i would almost agree with them i would just add disproportionately responsible for others feelings because right? we we have some responsibility but i can see why emotional slavery is when you're not in the proper proportion you think that and that's actually still egocentrism right even if it's outwardly oriented and you want people to feel better you're still not the center of the world and you're still not respond for responsible for that much of their feelings right? you have to understand where you stand i would also say you're not that responsible for your own feelings because you're basically pulling you know off of your your sense of worth off of how well you're able to satisfy other people's feelings no no i agree with you Galad, and just wanted to add that part yeah thanks yeah i don't know that i have much to add to unpacking that um just an observation on on these stages rosenberg also doesn't provide any evidence that these are the stages that people go through so this is sort of anecdotally in his experience he summarizes what he's seen uh, but i've it, in my experience it's a subset of people who ever go through life being a slave to others emotions uh, but it seems bizarre to me that that's where ev to claim that that's where everybody starts as stage one. I think that's where some people may start. Uh, I don't. I don't think I've ever been 
held myself a slave to other people's feelings. I was taught my feelings don't matter. So if, if my feelings don't matter, then yours don't matter either. Fair is fair. Nobody's feelings matters. <laughs> uh i definitely had been slave to other people's feelings so i would like just uh, because i'm a people pleaser i would be like oh my god my actions will make somebody feel bad but they have to feel good and so i would just like completely i would, would spend like hours and days and like even months of my life to make people feel better completely ignoring my own feelings and Honestly, the moment I realized that, it's like, oh, that's what I do. And actually, I, I feel better when I don't do that. Uh, gave me a lot of freedom, actually. So I'm definitely prone to go through stage one. I, I'm like, um, I don't notice that others do it, but I notice this in myself. Like, because I don't know what stages other people go through like but noticing other people's that's the first thought i have like what other people will feel if i do that that's actually like one of my things my my flaws yeah i think we can go to obnoxious now <laughs> isn't that uh nerdalian could you read for obnoxious <laughs> i knew i, I knew you, you seen it coming yeah I'll, I'll be the avatar of obnoxious ignoring other people's feelings about that uh, so the obnoxious stage is when we feel angry that i think he means that we ever were emotionally slaves but some of us were never emotionally slaves uh, and we no longer want to be responsible for others feelings uh, yeah so that actually we spoke a little bit about that earlier sort of saying that um you can do whatever i want like your feelings are on you don't uh, I'm doing me, whatever, let me be me, let me be, just let me be, I am who I am. <laughs> I think I'll, I'll go a bit meta again and say that, that this is um, maybe indicative of the the things we've been talking about uh, regarding this book and, and his thesis in general, right? That assumption that this is, you know, these are the three stages and specifically that this one is is like, an important developmental stage when like you need you no longer want to be responsible for other people other people's feelings it kind of resonates with kind of the whole the whole issue all of the issues we were discussing where where he's he's talking a lot about how not to be um to be affected by other people's actions but like there's a kind of under that there's this will to not be responsible for other people's uh, feelings, right? Because if I'm 100% responsible for my own feelings, then I can stop worrying about other people. So it kind of, I don't know, it fits together in that puzzle for me to what his kind of integrated worldview is. Um. My take on it is a little different. I don't know if he's actually so much talking about stages in a one, two, three, as he's talking about a Hegelian dialectic, with the one being the total slavery, the other being total freedom, and the third one being the balancing of the two. And again, his his basic metaphysics of, of how he sees responsibility and cause and effect and and all of that working together makes it kind of awkwardly phrased but that's sort of what i'm i'm seeing here with it being you know a, a thesis antithesis synthesis structure going on what do you guys think how is i'm not sure how the third is is the synthesis of the first two well, in, a, in essence, you're balancing your sense of the, you're, you're switching from this, emo this is my take, this isn't Rosenberg, because I, I separate cause and effect from uh, shame and blame. And some of that is because I, uh, because of my autism. And the way I see it is you're basically recognizing you have, your actions have cause and effect on both yourself and other people, and you're trying to balance 
your own feelings and emotions and needs with the feelings and emotions needs than others. It's like the first one is all other people. The second one is all you. And the third one is the synthesis, the balance of the two between all you, all them, basically an us synthesis and where both benefit. Does that make more sense, Galad? Uh, a bit. I just, I'm not sure how, how that, um, I mean, the third is pretty focused still on ourselves, so it doesn't it doesn't strike me like it's a real balance in that sense. But maybe it's just because it's um, you know this short summary sentence. But like just looking at it at the face of it, it looks to me like a transition from uh, what he calls emotional slavery or being uh, oriented outwardly to being oriented inwardly. Right. So, no, I I okay. agree with you a hundred percent. I as I sat there and was trying to say, I, I was reading that into it, and that may be something that I'm building a structure on top of his and noticing something that that he maybe was unconscious of when he was putting his stuff together. I actually think your your observation is a good one, Graham. I also see the the thesis a thesis sub, um, antithesis synthesis in there, and I'm just sort of remembering what he says in chapter one about giving from the heart. So um, I think that the way number three is supposed to integrate that is in the first emotional slavery, there's a shame and guilt and um, that drives wanting to take care of other people's feelings. In um, number two, there's a, an anger at being unfairly responsible for other people's um, feelings that drives people to act in ways that are bad for people. And I think in the third one, he says, um, in that stage, people take responsibility for wanting to be good for others out of a sense of compassion for them. So taking responsibility for our intention to be wholesome and that intention coming from a place of compassion, both for ourselves and compassion for the others, rather than a, a sense of um, like duty bound, um, at the threat of painful shame and, and guilt feelings of doing things. Thank you for saying that so much better than I could, Nadolian. Yeah, that was good. But the, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so the, the reason I think the um, thesis, uh, antithesis um, synthesis makes sense is because he doesn't um, give any developmental psychology data for that. So he hasn't done any longitudinal cross-sectional studies to like do empirical work to find are these the stages that people go through, but they do make a lot of sense analyzed in terms of like a Hegelian dialectic. So I think probably the thought process was closer to that sort of philosophical thought process rather than an empirical one. Uh, so I, I think that was a, a good observation. Yeah, I uh, just like going through my stages, like just again, purely projecting my own experience here. Uh, when I start with uh, noticing that I'm uh, doing things to please others because they might feel bad. And for me, for some reason, the way others feel really important. I don't think I go through the obnoxious, I, although actually I do. I do, it's, it's just like not, not very uh, noticeable or intense and I, at the end, I arrive at emotional liberation kind of acceptance thing. But it, those are all similar to stages of grief for me when I go through denial, through anger, through acceptance. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's the thing. Yeah, so the way I cope with uh, situations in general. So emotional liberations uh, is like, yeah, that's the way I choose it. Because I want, not because I would like to please others, but because I would like to change something because it aligned with the direction I'm trying to improve myself. And I don't think that uh, I'm in that particular case, um, I don't think the I uh, and me in that sentence is narcissistic. It's just like more, more ca ca character building. Uh, spine building, let's say, owning up to whatever I try to do. I, I agree. I think 
like responsibility uh, is usually a, a sort of counter to narcissism. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it depends what you mean by it, but I find that, that that's a word that uh, usually encompasses a lot of the kind of real relations that you need to understand you have in the world rather than uh, this idea of you know never use pronouns uh, other than I and what made you cause things. Right? So they say, well, you, ha you have a responsibility for how you react to that situation. That doesn't mean that it was all you. It doesn't mean that it was. So I, I agree with you then. So we close the chapter now. Uh, like I can uh, throw in uh, a fun slide that I made, which would just show example that most of the human beings share. Uh, the, we all like fun. Yes. So the needs that we all have, like according to Marshall B. Rosenberg. So those are the, just some of examples. Like we don't have to read it. I will just keep it on the screen. To, to maybe catch some uh, speaking points. But uh, the criticism, that is the aim of the discussion today. It's like, I, I really do want to know the flaws of the book and, and stuff like that. What stood out to me the most was the fact that um, context matters more than the speech itself. Sometimes you can say it in the most violent way, but the context matters. And like, sometimes you say the most violently, the words with the underlying subcontext, I missed you and I wanted to see you. And they're like, how dare you to be away? Did you know, like, I'm gonna scratch your eyes out just for looking so innocent, for making me feel so bad. So that sounds really violent, but the context matters a lot. And... Um, so that's the that's the thing, and sometimes this genuine genuine expression um, is way more pleasant to hear than robotic, very measured, leveled kind of way of nonviolent communication. So that's my take. What do you guys think? I think, like I did in the in the previous stream I was in. Uh, I mentioned that I think nonviolent communication is a is a great tool to go to when the normal communication is failed. It's a very bad one to replace normal communication. And if, if you just if you only do this, I think you'll have a problem, right? Because sometimes you're out with some friends and they're gonna tell some jokes and you're gonna say like shut the hell up or something because that's the funny and you know appropriate thing to say or, or whatever right like people communicate in very intricate and implicit ways so so like throwing that away is, is a really bad idea but when you're in a state with someone and, and you feel like i don't know what's going on i don't want to be in this situation something is let's say under the surface that i cannot get to then yeah, maybe this kind of structure of like these um, don't go like don't go for the automatic things. Don't go for saying what you uh, have judged the situation to be. What do you feel the other person is doing? Or just like, huh? Okay, uh, this is weird. I'm feeling threatened. Whatever you're feeling, and then maybe from that you can rebuild something. No, very well said, Gilad. I was going to say, one of the things I think that we need to factor in is I think when Rosenberg talks about that coming from the heart, he's basically precluding the possibility of narcissism because he's basically assuming in both people are starting with that as their starting point. So they're going to want to be driven to resolve the problems that a narcissist is going to, going to prey upon. And I think from that standpoint, Rosenberg's, you know, the structure he's building is good, say, within a committed partner relationship. If you're having a, if you have an area of conflict, it can help you uh, 
dive down and figure out exactly where you're having that conflict and resolve it between the two. And that's because of that assumption that Rosenberg has that you're both coming from that place of heart and you're both wanting to resolve the problem. And I think it, keeping that in mind may help keep the limits and the bounds on what Rosenberg's talking about more in sense. Does that make sense with you guys? Tag out. That makes yeah. sense. Um, for me, the big takeaway, I think, is quite close to what Irina pointed out, is the um, f finding the, like, the real underlying cause of emotions can be very difficult. And it can be very unhelpful in a conflict situation to um, go around blaming things that like just in untrue ways, or sometimes even in true ways, but unhelpful ways. Um, so thinking clearly about what those things are, and, and often there are um, needs we want and needs in a very broad sense, because like Rosenberg uses needs to include desires that we don't necessarily need. Um, so yeah, our, our interests, I think is a, a word that's used in, uh, in negotiation as a, as a general thing instead of needs. So interests can be goals and objectives or desires, or they can, and those can be of various levels of criticality. You can have critical interest that without those you die. Um, but yeah, so when communicating um, emotions, being clear about the link those emotions have with true interests and communicating them together. And what he doesn't explore much in this um, in this book, and there are many ways in which this happened, I think Graham has brought up one thing is that feelings can actually be disconnected from our true interests. So we can have feelings for reasons of past traumas, having um, triggering associations with feelings that are not linked to our best interests. Um, sort of finding out when our feelings are caused by things that are making us behave in ways that are not in our interests are also an important element, I think, of wise negotiation and problem solving. And especially in a relationship, there may be harsh feelings that isn't necessarily caused by either, but is causing problems for both in the relationship. Um, and I think the big move is having the relational context and the intentions to be on the same side and try to find solutions to those problems together. Uh, especially in the context when feelings are hurt and feelings are running high, that can be very difficult to to pull off. Like when everything's going well and everybody's feeling good, then yeah, we can be on the same side. But when both people are not feeling good, it can be very difficult to say like, well, even though we're both angry, or even though I'm angry and you're scared, or you're scared and I'm angry, can we like acknowledge those feelings and still operate as if we're on the same side trying to resolve them? Um, and trying to figure out together what are our interests and what is the relationship between our, our feelings and our interests. Um, yeah, I, th I think that relational context for me is more important than the what pronouns you use and whether or not you uh, include only other people's actions. Or like, all, all that stuff is contextual. Um, and when the when the problems are sufficiently resolved and the memory isn't too painful anymore, but having a good laugh at it by violently joking about it could be awesome fun. Okay. So uh, uh, we are closing in four minutes. I just uh, just for the last thing, um, I want to mention the painting. So that's the painting by E.M. Uh, it's <laughs> it it was discussed in uh, Food for Thought um, number four. No number. I I will check it later. <laughs> I think number four. So, <laughs> yes, it was discussed in Food for Thought number four, and uh, here it's called Wheel of Emotion, and it does have narcissism here, which is uh, so this couple. That's a narcissistic abuse. It's like there. Like, the, uh, like apparently it's a guy sniffer or something like and she's like on high heels a narcissist <laughs> I find that couple really fascinating <laughs> yeah, so, so that's it um, and like yeah basically 
this is the samples of healthy relationships and unhealthy relationships okay like i go into details in discussing that uh painting by em and um, on that side uh, are the things that we all have in common so the implication is get people out of their anger and stuff and remind them that we all have in common air food movement exercise i'm, I'm, I'm not sure that everybody likes those <laughs> like, i mean find find <laughs> someone who feels down on himself and tell him but at least you have self-worth and then I was like oh creativity oh <laughs> Like, that's the thing, like, the integrity part is a triggering one. <laughs> like, we share the same self-worth. It's like, speak for yourself. <laughs> and then, uh, like, yeah, acceptance, appreciation, closeness. And uh, there are more. It's like some of those. There is also desire for playfulness, desire for a joyful time together. Uh, like this happy people in here <clears throat> sorry <laughs> those happy people in here okay so uh, Graham, Gilad Nerdalian thank you all for coming thank you uh, to all the people in com comments uh, Tito, Irina also Andre thank you for showing up and I'm going to end the stream right here <laughs>